Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Becky Seabrook, and I am the Senior Director of Guest Engagement here at the Health Museum in Houston, Texas, where our mission is to empower healthier living. And we are so happy to be part of this effort today to bring you this Sci Cafe program. Um, at this point, I would like to turn it over to our moderator for today, Krista Bone, who comes to this program from the University of Texas Medical Branches Institute for Translational Science. Krista, thank you so much for being here today. And I would love for you to go ahead and talk a little bit about what the program is going to be today, some of the partners that are here with us. Thank you, Becky. And thank you everyone who's joining us. Um, I'm so excited uh, to be with you virtually today uh, for our side cafe on military exposures and veterans health. So my name is Krista Bone. Like Becky said, I am with UTMB's Institute for Translational Sciences, and I will be the moderator today for our Sci Cafe. I'd first uh, like to thank our partners who have been integral in putting this on today. First, the Gulf Coast Center for Precision Environmental Health, which is a partnership between Baylor College of Medicine, um, the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health, and the University of Texas Medical Branch. I'd also like to thank the Health Museum for hosting our discussion today. And I will note that they actually have an exhibit right now um, called the Veterans Vision Project that Becky can maybe talk a little bit about at the end, um, which really captures the diversity of veterans experience. Um, so I invite you to check that out if you are ever in the area. Finally, I'd like to thank Combined Arms and Mission United for their partnership in this initiative as well. So uh, for those of you who are new to Sci Cafe, I'll give you just a little bit of background. Sci Cafe stands for where science and communities interact. And so we invite you to do just that with us today with our wonderful panelists. We want you to be able to ask questions, um, share your concerns, your input with us. And we really want this to be a dialogue and a conversation, um, which can be a little bit hard to do virtually, but we will do our best to uh, make sure that the discussion today uh, is focused on kind of your priorities and your questions. I will also note that we want to keep uh, the discussion focused on military exposures and veterans health. So please no promotion of um, personal business or uh, devices that you might be um, involved with. So we will start off with each of our panelists taking about five or six minutes to introduce themselves and give you a little bit of background on what they do and their expertise. And then we invite you to um, type any questions you have into the chat. Since we have um, about 25 or 30 of us, I think it's also uh, fine if people want to use the raise hand feature and we can unmute um, so you can ask your question uh, live if you would like to do it that way as well. And I will also note, since it's kind of hard to do virtually, just please be respectful um, of everyone's time. And so uh, please allow everyone to ask your questions that they, that they have. So without further ado, I will um, turn this over to our speakers. Um, today, we are joined by Dr. Drew Helmer, who is the Deputy Director for the Center for Innovations in Quality, Effectiveness, and Safety at the VA Center. And he's also with Baylor College of Medicine. We are also joined by John Smith, uh, who is the Southeast Texas Regional Manager at Combined Arms. Uh, Texas Veterans Network, and he himself is a veteran. Last but not least, we are joined by Dr. Lee Steele, Director of the Veterans Health Research Program and past Scientific Director of the U.S. Research Advisory Committee on Gulf War Veterans Illness, and she is also with Baylor College of Medicine. So I will pass it off first to John to get us started, and um, again, just please utilize that chat feature with questions and we will get to those after the speakers have a moment to introduce themselves. Go ahead, John. Awesome, thank you so much, Krista. Like Krista said, I'm John Smith. Yes, that's my real name. And I am a nine year uh, Marine Corps veteran, uh, was served from 99 to 08 and did one tour in Iraq. Um, from there, I've uh, since then started working with Combined Arms and I'm now the Southeast Texas Regional Manager. 
And if you're unfamiliar with combined arms, we're a single source for veterans to get connected to resources. And of course, we do a lot of work with the VA and our local researchers. And we're very honored to be a part of this because the best way to get information out is through uh, resources and venues like this. And of course, uh, myself and everybody else here at Combined Arms wants our veteran community to be educated, especially on topics such as exposure. So please, please, please utilize this time to ask your questions and um, pick the brains of these awesome, outstanding doctors that we have uh, with us. So uh, thank you again, and I greatly appreciate it. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Drew Homer. Thanks, John. And um, thank you to the Health Museum and all our partners for, for setting this up. And thank you to the participants. Uh, I just wanna reiterate, we are here to hear you. And so I'm going to keep my comments brief, but I'm, I'm gonna try to provide an overview of what we mean by military exposures and, and hopefully share some information that might help you think about your own exposure concerns and what you might do about them. Uh, so just by way of definitions, you know, I like to think of military exposures as contact with a toxic substance that occurs during your military service. And this can be while you're deployed to combat or it can be while you're sitting in your barracks, right? So there are all sorts of toxic substances that you have to use when you're in the military or that you might be exposed to um, as, matter, as a matter of course, actually. So specifically, when we talk about exposures, it's not enough to have that toxic substance sitting on the shelf over here, right? It needs to get into your body. And, and so I think we think about that through four major ways. You can either inhale it, breathe it in, um, and certainly burn pit smoke is an example of that. Um, Agent Orange coming down from a plane may be inhaled. You can also ingest it. It can be in your food or your water. It might get into your mouth. You might swallow it. It can also get into your body through your skin, through a, 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 a dermal contact. Um, you know, once again, a liquid that maybe gets on your skin or sulfur mustard gas or something, a vesicant might, it might enter through your skin. And finally, there are circumstances where it gets inserted or injected into your skin. Um, and, you know, for example, the VA has a toxic embedded fragments uh, program that looks at shrapnel that, that service members experience, and then they can track those people uh, to see whether there are any toxic substances in the shrapnel that may be leaching into the body. Um, so those are the four roots of kind of contact that we worry about when we talk about military exposures. You know, another concept that I like to think about is that um, there are some military exposures that almost everybody experiences when they're in the military, regardless of branch or component. Um, but there are also some that are very specific to a location or a job or even a time, right? And, and so um, a second way of thinking about this is that there are these environmental exposures, things that are just out here. Uh, and there are things that are very much part of your job. And just to give a couple of specific examples of those, you've got smoke from burn pits. <clears throat> you've got maybe the low concentration of uh, nerve agents that were encountered in the Gulf War in 1990, 91. Um, but if, if you have a military job occupation, you may be exposed primarily to fuels or to solvents, or maybe you work with uh, ionizing radiation, like at a missile silo or something like that. So there's a difference between you know, one way of thinking about these or organizing these military exposures is by environmental versus occupational. Um, I want to emphasize that the VA does offer uh, services to veterans who have military exposure concerns. Um, and there are the registry exams are examples of those. The VA offers an Agent Orange registry exam, a Gulf War registry exam, an ionizing radiation exam and of course the burn pit registry exam. And so those, those services are available um, at, at VA medical centers. In addition, those are registry exams are a little separate from clinical care or, or can sometimes be a little separate. They can be a little bit more uh, about tracking. Uh, and, but the VA also can address these concerns through the regular primary care, local specialty care, and then there are these tertiary uh, national referral centers that we call the war-related illness and injury study centers, where if you have a chronic 
uh, health concern that might be related to a deployment to, to experience in a war zone, uh, you can get a referral to one of those centers for additional evaluation. It's part of a continuum of care that's available within the VA. Finally, I want to, or not finally, but I want to highlight also that on the benefit side of things, uh, the Veterans Benefits Administration does provide service-connected disability for health effects related to military exposures. Sometimes these are what we call presumed service-connected conditions. Uh, so for example, with Agent Orange exposure, uh, veterans who were in theater in Vietnam and certain other locations and, uh, are presumed to have developed diabetes, for example, because of that exposure. And so you don't have to prove that connection the same way you might have to on a case-by-case -case basis for something that's less, that, that's not presumed service-connected. Um, and so those, that uh, aspect of what the VA offers to veterans, you know, that, that service-connected disability can be very important and, you know, is uh, often a source of questions or frustrations uh, when it doesn't kind of make sense in terms of what they're doing. Um, I think two other things that I want to highlight. One is that the VA is also actively researching health effects related to military exposures. Uh, that's one of the things I do. I'm an internist and I see patients, but I also do research related to military exposures. Uh, and the VA is really kind of doubling down on, on looking at military exposure health effects uh, right now as, as we're talking about it. And of course, the Department of Defense also has a research program and they fund a lot of research related to Gulf War illness, for example, or burn pit smoke exposure. Um, their focus does tend to be a little bit more on mitigation of risks and how to uh, ensure um, uh, readiness for duty and how to preserve readiness for duty. Whereas the VA is a little bit more interested in the long-term health effects and treating and mitigating the consequences of those long-term health effects. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Steele so she can make a few opening comments and um, then we'll hopefully open it up to questions and uh, get to hear from you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you all for those great comments um, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Dr. Lee Steele. I'm a neuroepidemiologist and I'm a professor at Baylor College of Medicine. And my special expertise are the long-term health effects of military service in the 1991 Persian Gulf War. Um, I, I wanna to start today just by saying a few more words about the Gulf Coast Center for Precision Environmental Health. Krista mentioned it briefly. It's uh, one of the organizing hosts of our event today. Um, this is a regional consortium of medical schools and healthcare institutions that um, focused on uh, research and community support related to health effects of environmental exposures. So as part of that, our institutions um, are developing a program that focuses on the health effects of military exposures, that is hazardous exposures during military service. And the idea here is to kind of be a bridge between um, researchers that have expertise in these areas and um, veterans who have been affected by some of these concerns. And so our idea here is to start a dialogue that on the one hand informs veterans about what we've learned from the research and what programs are available to them. And then on the other hand, to inform researchers and healthcare providers about some of the health effects that veterans have experienced and what their concerns are and how we might sort of bridge the gap between what we know and what we still need to find out. So uh, we really, you know, we hope this will be the start of a dialogue of that type um, and that you will inform us and we can help inform you as well. Um, so uh, let me just, kind of, you know, overview wise, I, I think we're all aware of sort of the long history of military exposures and some of the concerns around that. I mean, starting, you know, probably from before I knew about any of this, but, you know, World War II, we know about the atomic fallout, some of the, the chemical weapons exposures, the 1950s, we know Camp Lejeune and the drinking water problems. And then, you know, 60s and 70s, Agent Orange and the the herbicides and the defoliants from Vietnam. Then we moved to Desert Storm in 1991 and a whole host of concerns, oil well fires, 
depleted uranium nerve agents, all kinds of things that have come up as possible concerns. And then now with Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, uh, the burn pits and all the myriad compounds that might be associated with that, as well as a number of other things. So there are a lot of topics that we could potentially address, and we hope we'll get some feedback from you today about what you're what you're concerned about and what you'd like to know more about. And we certainly, we have our own expertise and we, we have a lot of colleagues that, that know other areas as well and as well as all kinds of resources we can tap into. So um, my area, as I said, is the 1991 Gulf War. And I can just tell you from a research perspective, a lot of progress has been made in that area. We are beginning to understand the nature of Gulf War illness, what used to be called Gulf War syndrome. We have a, a much clearer picture of what it looks like, what the biology is that is different in veterans with Gulf War illness, which exposures are the most um, highly associated with Gulf War illness. And the short version is it is a short list of things that are toxic to the, to the brain and the nervous system called neurotoxicants. And so, um, you know, we're, we're concerned about some of the biological effects that we're seeing in veterans, but the good news is that we are now starting to have treatment studies that specifically address Gulf War illness. Um, one study on CoQ10, the supplement, showed really good positive effects for veterans, and there's a lot of additional studies going on now to, to drill down on that a little bit better. There are also a lot of animal studies that have shown compounds to, uh, to show some benefits. So we are now, uh, we'll be able to test those in human studies of veterans. And so hopefully we'll have a lot more good news coming down the pipe soon. So I'll just stop there and turn it back over to Krista. Hey, thank you so much for um, all of y'all's remarks. Um, it looks like Laura has her hand raised. Um, you know, can click around. Talk. Laura, do you have a question? Hmm. Oh, I apologize. I think I may have hit that by accident. Okay, no problem. No problem. It's like I said, with virtual, uh, it's, you know, always a, a learning experience. So um, just a reminder that you can raise your hand with questions. It looks like Tom might have a question. So I will go ahead and allow Tom to talk. Um, am I unmuted at this point? You are, we can hear you. Okay, well, uh, it's really exciting to see the both of you working at this problem. Drew, it's particularly nice to have rescued you from New Jersey and brought you back to Houston again. I realized that didn't happen yesterday, but um, it's great to have you here again. Uh, and I think that one of the questions I'd have is, you know, how much insight have we gained into, you know, what causes this? I mean, is this an immune dis disorder? It, it, what is the environmental impact of whatever? And first off, do we have an idea of what whatever might be? And if we have an idea of what whatever it might be, what does it do to you? Um, is there, are there, you know, leading leads, so to speak, in that right now that ought to be pursued or that are being pursued? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Costin. Uh, the, um, I think you're referring to Gulf War illness specifically, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, so absolutely. I think like Dr. Steele was saying, I, I, I agree with her impression that we are making progress and that I, I would say the leading theory at this point is that neurotoxicants uh, encountered during the Gulf, probably in combination, have damaged uh, the nerves in the central nervous system, especially, um, and are contributing in some way to neurodegeneration. I think the exact pathway of that is still under investigation. And I think how that relates to uh, the immune system is also a little unclear, but there are hints of abnormalities, you know, in the immune system, in the mitochondrial function. Um, I would also say that um, uh, the autonomic nervous system, you know, whether it's whether it's peripheral damage as well as central, I think is also possible based on some of the uh, findings that we've seen uh, across studies. Uh, but it, it all does kind of point to uh, a neurodegenerative sort of uh, picture at this point. You know, what are the implications? I think, you know, Gulf War illness itself has been mostly primarily defined uh, by, by the symptoms experienced and, 
you know, I think the VA and the DOD use the term chronic multi-symptom illness, which refers to having chronic, long, long-term, long-standing uh, physical uh, experiences that are unpleasant and uh, interfere in your life, and, and that they're across multiple domains. Uh, you know, it's not just a single body system that's affected. And, and trying to find the unifying uh, source of these diverse symptoms has been especially challenging uh, in Gulf War illness, as it is in other conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia or irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, and, but you know, I do think we're making some progress in getting a better understanding of how that nerve degeneration can be related and cause some of those symptoms. It's imperfect. Um, and I think we're still trying to figure out, test some more specific hypotheses. As we learn more, we can narrow the question, hone the question a little bit better and, and really see what the mechanism is. Dr. Steele, do you want to? Yeah, I, I will just say that um, you're right. There's been so much research and it's shown little pieces of information, mostly related to the brain and the nervous system, also related to the immune system. I would say the most consistent theme that we see both in human studies of veterans and also in animal studies who have been exposed to the toxicants that veterans were exposed to is a, a common pattern of, uh, it's kind of the immune system of the brain, glial cell activation, neuroinflammatory problems. And we know from many, many studies that those can explain many of the symptoms that we see across the board in Gulf War veterans. So I think the leading hypothesis is a neuroinflammatory one, Dr. Poston. And um, with the addition of mitochondrial defects and things, which actually could play right into the neuroinflammatory picture as well. So, so a lot of the treatments that people are trying are to intervene with that neuroinflammatory process. Thank you. Great, thank you. We had a question come in. Do we have any information on the experimental drugs that were given to Desert Shield slash Storm veterans? There was great concern about nerve agents being used against us. We were given a shot before deployment that was supposed to protect against nerve agents. There were also green pills that were given while we were out over there. Well, there was a few things used during Desert Storm that had never been used before, and some have not been used since. Um, and, you know, in a way they were experimental, but probably not all experimental. So. The, the paradistichmine bromide pills, the little white pills in the blister packets that you had to take every, you know, three times a day when you were ordered by command, um, those had to get a special dispensation from FDA to be able to use it during the Gulf War. And um, those, uh, those are still part of DOD policy to use, but they haven't really been used since the Gulf War. So those have been well identified and are very much studied both in human and animal studies. And it's one of the leading contenders for one of the causes of Gulf War illness. Um, the anthrax vaccine, this was the first time that that had been used widespread in the military. Um, the Gulf War illness studies aren't showing a connection very definitively, just very, a few studies have, but mostly not. Um, and as you know, everyone gets the anthrax vaccine now. There are some questions about whether the anthrax vaccine during the Gulf War are this, is the same as the one used now, but that's another uh, meeting discussion, I think. Um, also, there was another vaccine given botulinum toxin that hadn't been used before. Um, otherwise, I know there were a lot of shots and people got gamma globulin shots as well. Um, people took other pills um, in relation to like doxycycline and things that were supposed to help. Um, in, in terms of there were certain biological concerns, but um, those weren't experimental. So that, that's kind of the big picture on, on the new things that, that veterans were exposed to during the Gulf War. I, I'd like to just add that, you know, any, any medication, whether it's, you know, approved or not approved can have side effects. And often the side effects are related to the individual's genetic makeup. So my genetic makeup is different from your genetic makeup. And, and, and partially because of that difference, I might have a side effect and you might not. We actually think there might be something like that going on with Gulf War illness as well, that you know, whether it's a single exposure, whether it's you know, a single chemical, or whether it's a combination of chemicals that you know, 
I'm standing right here next to my buddy and he gets Gulf War illness and I don't, it could be a genetic component to that as well. Um, but it's a great question. Great, thank you. Uh, can we ever get a standard list of diagnostic tests at least suggested to the VA providers and add to that suggested consults to be made? I, I, I can take that one. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's that a great suggestion. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really good idea. I think um, you know there's there are so many variations on a theme uh, with Gulf War illness or or with other exposures of concern, for example, that uh, it's really important that a clinician work with the patient and take an individualized approach to the evaluation and management of that person's problems. And so in the VA, you know, we talk about whole health. We talk about looking at the whole person and, and talking about goals of care and, and, and really trying to understand what the, what the patient uh, is prioritizing while bringing our medical knowledge to the, to the conversation and, and making, adv making advising, you know, what, what we think should be done. So I think there's a, um, there's a role for saying, you know, do these tests to be sure you're not missing something. But a lot of the testing that we would recommend is actually just part of the standard of care. So if somebody comes in with fatigue, uh, trained clinicians know what to order in terms of diagnostic testing to try to understand what's causing that fatigue. Um, there is nothing specific, and if we're talking about Gulf War illness now, there's nothing, there's no specific biomarker that we can use that will say, aha, this is Gulf War illness. Um, but there are a lot of tests that we can do uh, to be sure that we're not missing a different diagnosis. Um, and so I think there's this, uh, the list that we would need to create could be very long uh, in order to address a standard of care for the workup of each of the symptoms that we might see in Gulf War illness. And so it'd be hard to make a rule about that. But I do think the idea of having some basic, um, you know, don't forget this uh, sort of list is, is appropriate. There, the, the VA and DOD did just release an update to the clinical practice guideline for the management of chronic multi-symptom illness. Uh, and, and the CMI term is not specific to Gulf War illness. It, it is intended to be applicable to all cohorts and even dependents who get care in, in the DOD system. Uh, and so there, there, while there is not a specific list of tests there, there are some really good uh, recommendations and guidance on, on how to do the evaluation and what sort of management approach to use. So that's something that's available to cl clinicians and uh, the group is actually developing uh, some patient fact sheets and some patient uh, facing materials as well. Great. Um, we had a question. What about those of us who were stationed in the Aleutians during the 70s, 80s and 90s where nuclear bomb testing was going on until the 1970s and nuclear bomb repair was happening into the 90s? Are there any programs addressing the exposures, the nuclear and radiation, as well as the other chemicals that have been dumped in that area from World War II to the 1990-base closures? I, I don't know, Drew, if you're familiar. I, I only know of the problem. I don't know of any programs for it, but I will certainly look this up and see what I can find out and talk to the people who may have a program of that nature. Drew, are you aware of a program? related for the Aleutian Islands? So I, not one specific to the Aleutian Islands, but there are, um, there is the ionizing radiation registry exam. And I do not recall the exact eligibility criteria for that exam, but that is something that we can explore and share back out to you. Um, and so it, it sounds like that, that may be a starting point for, for this concern. Um, also, there are some programs in VA where they have been able to access the, um, the uh, records from the DOD about lifetime exposure to ionizing radiation. 
Um, and so I believe there's a way of accessing uh, kind of the personal exposure based on your badge. Um, so I, I don't know enough about whether whether that program includes individuals who were stationed in the Aleutian Islands uh, at that time that you're talking about, but th I can also look into that a little bit more and see how we can uh, explore what's possible with that. Do we have your email or we would be happy to reach out back to you if we have your contact information? Yes, we have that from the registration so we can uh, follow up uh, with her on that. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, this is just as important for our uh, researchers and panelists to know what the concern concerns mm -hmm. are from veterans. So appreciate that question. Uh, we had a question come in. When will providers at the VA get training, um, even in their orientation? Why not have some organized meetings with Gulf War vets and providers to improve communication? Veterans and their spouses do not always feel that their provider is truly aware of our problem. Yeah, I think that that's an that's always a, a challenge. You know, our workforce does change, uh, and I'm not speaking for that. I guess I should have put my disclaimer. I'm not speaking on behalf of the VA, uh, but uh, you know, there is a lot of turnover in the VA, and I think there's also always opportunities to remind providers to um, to do things. Military exposures in general, while while they're so central to the care of veterans. Uh, I think uh, a lot of providers find it very difficult to master, you know, this knowledge. I think what 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 would be ideal is for everybody to have an awareness of the importance of military exposures. Every clinician, and even even some of the non-clinicians, so that if you come in and say, "Hey, I have this, I have this concern about burn pits, and I really want to talk to somebody," the clerk can say, "Oh, you know, we should hook you up with this or something like that." Um, and so I think I think we could probably uh, request a greater awareness around military exposure concerns, but I think there is kind of an expertise, and we definitely need that stepped care, that kind of continuum of care, uh, where patients can can be referred to somebody with a little deeper knowledge, and um, you know maybe a more immediate awareness of some of the resources that are available. And, and, and let's not forget, I mean, there are people on the outside of the VA as well with expertise uh, in these areas. Uh, there are occupational environmental medicine doctors who specialize in, in uh, exposure concerns. And so there are opportunities to seek out some, of, some answers outside of the VA as well. And there's certainly a lot of good research happening outside of the VA. Um, but I think uh, a more general awareness of exposure concerns and uh, health consequences would be appreciated. We hear that from many veterans. And yeah, and, and as a veteran myself, you know, one of the things that we always have to make sure is that we do advocate for ourselves. You know, we, we have to be extremely grateful to have a VA because mo most other countries don't even have a VA. So especially be thankful for that. But through Combined Arms, you're able to connect with like the Texas Veterans Commission, Healthcare Advocacy Department. So perhaps you guys are trying to reach out to the VA and just not getting anywhere. There's other outside programs such as TVCHCAD, which is the healthcare advocacy department, will help you get to your solutions that you need. And th that's pretty much all they do is they help you veterans get connected to the, the right to department within the VA. The VA is there and yes, it, it has its hiccups, but we're grateful that it's there and it has a lot of great programs. Sometimes we just have to advocate for ourselves to get to the right position. Thank you for adding that, John. That's a great point. Um, we had a note. I want to thank Dr. Helmer for all his leadership in helping and advising Gulf War veterans and Dr. Steele for all her work on Gulf War illness over the past several decades. So just a, a kudos to y'all. Um, Michelle, I see your email address. We'll follow up with you there. Um, we did also have some pre-submitted questions I want to make sure we get to as well. Um, can kids or future generations be affected by um, a parent's prior military exposure? Um, I, there, there's more than one answer. I, I will say that um, for many exposures, that hasn't been looked at much. But uh, the one that's best known is that from Vietnam, Agent Orange exposure. Um, we know that it had effects on children of veterans. 
both male veterans and female veterans. Um, male veterans can be, uh, their children can get health care and benefits if the children have spina bifida. Uh, for female veterans, it can be more birth outcomes besides spina bifida. Um, and I think there have been concerns raised from the Gulf War for intergenerational effects as well, but it hasn't been studied very much. There have been a few studies that have pointed to small increases in certain kinds of outcomes. Other studies have not found them. So I think it's an area that really needs to be looked at more closely. And I don't know of anyone looking at it uh, for uh, burn pit exposures or, or any of that. Maybe Dr. Helmer, do you know? I, I don't think it's been looked at very systematically yet. Um, I think, you know, like you said, there are a couple of different ways of looking at the effects on, on, on children and potentially even grandchildren of veterans. Um, there are concerns, of, of course, about uh, what we call teratogenicity. That is, you know, if somebody is pregnant and they're exposed, you know, is there a bad effect on, on the fetus in utero? Um, there's also concerns about what we call germline mutations, where there's a change to the sperm or the egg uh, before fertilization, and then that has an effect on the um, on the outcome of the of the of the fetus. Uh, there's also some interest in in looking at the epigenetics. So, so these are kind of the I, I think of it as the DNA is the cake, and then you've got the icing on the cake. And you know sometimes that icing is very important. It makes the, it makes the cake taste really good. Um, or if if the epigenetics get uh, messed up a little bit, the cake may not taste as good. Um, and so you've got um, this second layer and the, epigen the epigenome seems to be susceptible to certain exposures. And we're just beginning to understand which exposures can have those epigenetic effects and which ones can then ca cause harm to the, to, the, to the next generation or perhaps even get carried on into further generations. So um, there was a National Academies of Science report on, on the, health, the health effects of the offspring of the next generations after exposure. And, and it basically called for um, more research in the area so that we can really define it. And I'll say this is not specific to, this is not just for veterans. I mean, we're here talking about military exposures and exposures that that military personnel and veterans might be concerned about, but you know our environment is is also uh, swimming in some harmful substances, and we may be exposed to those uh, just living living in modern America, and so it's an it's an area that's kind of ripe for uh, research. And uh, I think in some ways the military exposures are a little more confined and a little more defined, and we might be able to find some answers more easily among the veteran, within the veteran population. Um, so hopefully we can get answers faster about whether there are, whether there are health effects. Thank you. Um, it looks like Tom has raised his hand again. Um, Does that mean I should talk now? Okay. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, as you think about environmental exposures, we tend to think of those as exposures that come from bad things imposed upon us. But unfortunately, there are bad things that we impose upon ourselves, um, most notably alcohol, marijuana, illicit drugs. Now, I recognize that over there, people were in fact in a country that uh, didn't even allow alcohol. Um, but you know, I've met with a couple of veterans who admit to um, drinking every once in a while over there. And I just wonder if those interactions are being thought about, particularly as you think about brain interactions and the things that these drugs of abuse can, can do to your neurons, which is not always kind, um, and that often don't show up for, you know, years. Um, so have those those other environmental toxins that, that people introduce to themselves been thought through? Um, so, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say for Desert Storm, um, you're right, most people weren't drinking in theater, but it doesn't mean that they haven't been drinking since. Um, for many of the studies, they exclude people with any active alcohol issues 
or uh, illicit drug issues. Um, and so that's, in theory, won't be part of the study findings where we find the brain effects and the immune effects. But in, in veterans' lives, certainly uh, they can have all kinds of comorbidities, and that can include um, any kind of substance abuse. Uh, again, Desert Storm has a relatively low rate of PTSD and things like that compared to other deployments, just because it was a short war and most people were not even in, in combat or in a combat zone. That said, for other uh, deployments, I am very aware of people studying, for example, combination effects of TBI with alcohol exposure and then other uh, compounds of, uh, of concern. And so I know it's an active area of study for um, other deployments because it's never simple. And especially when you're talking about exposures, it's never simple. So it is definitely, you always have to take that into consideration. I don't know of real effects other than how it affects how people respond to treatment. So if you're treating someone for, for TBI, for example, and they also have um, an alcohol abuse issue, their response to treatment will be different. And, you know, and so that's a consideration. Yeah, I think the only the only thing I would add to that is uh, we definitely saw an uptick in uh, smoking, cigarette smoking. Uh, many, many service members actually pick up the habit, even, even though maybe the US government isn't pushing it the way they did in World War II, it's still fairly common for people to either increase their smoking cigarette use or start cigarette use during deployment. Uh, and from an airborne hazards concern, you know, when we think about burn pit smoke exposure and uh, particulate matter exposure that occurs from ambient, you know, just environmental uh, industrial air pollution, uh, the smoking, we suspect, is actually quite important uh, in terms of uh, examining that. In the research that's done, of course, we try to control for that. We try to take that out of the equation when we're analyzing the data. Um, and in prospective studies, you know, it's often similarly um, active smokers are excluded from, from many of these research protocols. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Costin, to your, to your, maybe the broader point here is that it is a combination of exposures. You know, I, I have not been deployed. I've, I've not served in the military, but from what I hear, you know, you're, it's not just one thing that, that you're, you're experiencing. You're experiencing a whole toxic soup of, of things if you're working in the motor pool and the burn pit smoke is wafting your direction and there's a, you know, some sort of plant right off the base that's belching smoke out of there. So. You know, it, it really is about kind of combinations. And of course, science has a hard time doing that in, in, in many uh, research paradigms. And so I think answering these questions can be very challenging uh, because of the combinations of the exposures. I don't know, John, you look like you might want to chime in there with something. Oh, no, I was just totally agreeing with you. It's not just one singularity issue. It's, you know, a couple, I mean, just myself, I was aviation. And so, you know, there was fiberglass repair substances that we used, then right over to the, the radiation from the different types of uh, inspections that we did. And then on top of the different types of hydraulic fluids that were in the aircraft. So it's like you said, it's a multiple array of different types of exposures. Thank you. Uh, we had a question, are medical schools uh, teaching about military exposures or are there rotations that focus on veterans with exposures or even um, a route for them to develop a total specialty? Go ahead, Drew, I think we have yeah. the same answer. Well, so, so I, I, you know, in my humble opinion, right, I think, I think it's not taught enough. Uh, I think the curriculum, the medical school curriculum, I'm, I'm not, I'm not actively teaching at the moment, but it's jam packed with a, a ton of information. And so the amount of time that medical students get or even uh, most residents get that that devotes to any sort of occupational or environmental medicine is small. Now, there is an entire specialty where you use you focus on occupational environmental medicine. And, uh, you know, I, there are several excellent programs around the country that produce OEM physicians some of whom work in the VA and, and actually bring that, that really critical expertise to the VA um, or to the Department of Defense. Uh, but it's, you know, it is, it is difficult to, 
to find people with that expertise. And, and then specifically for military exposures, I would say that no curricula are focused specifically on those exposures and the effects on military populations. But you know, luckily, gladly, there are a lot of researchers, both in um, VA and in and, and other institutions that are very focused on this. And so they, they bring up their students and their, and their interns and their residents, and they sort of train them individually that way. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question came in, a 2013 paper said that there's not enough medical uh, or scientific information on long-term health effects from exposure to burn pits, which is limiting the number of presumptive illnesses that veterans can attribute to burn pit exposures. What are your thoughts on this statement today, given any research that may be out there? So it's very possible I was an author on that paper. So I'll go ahead and take the first crack at it. Um, so we have learned a lot since 2013. It's that's eight years ago, um, and you know the publications always lag by a year or so in terms of what you know. Uh, I, I think uh, probably the most significant update is that the VA has recognized uh, asthma rhinitis and sinusitis as presumed service-connected conditions for uh, veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, if, if they are documented within 10 years of your deployment. Um, so that is something that is, is, I guess it's not hot off the press anymore, but you know, around late June, early July, that was announced by the VA. Um, there are different uh, standards of evidence that are required for uh, kind of talking about associations or what we call causality, does, does X cause Y? Um, I think uh, the challenge with the airborne hazards exposures, generally speaking, is that um, it's partly what specifically are we talking about when we talk about airborne hazards? Uh, and then what is the outcome we're looking at? Uh, once again, I'll, I'll refer to the National Academies of Science. Uh, there was a recent report that looked at the strength of evidence for an association between various airborne hazards, particulate matter, burn pit smoke. Uh, maybe you could even think about uh, industrial uh, ambient air pollution, other, other components of air pollution and health outcomes. And they were pretty holistic about what they looked at, pretty comprehensive. And they, they really found very limited evidence, uh, scientific evidence at the level they were looking for to say that there was a cause and effect. Uh, despite that, the VA went ahead with presumed service connections for some of those conditions. Um, you know, my own take is uh, we, we, need to, we need to be sure that we are clear about what we're talking about. Are we talking about burn pit smoke exposure? Are we talking about particulate matter in general? Are we talking about something else? And when we look at the health effects, is it possible that there was something else that caused the health effect? You know, kind of a, along the same line of a combination. Um, you know, was it possible that it was smoking and something? Was it possible that it's uh, a, what we call a gene by environment interaction, that there is people who are susceptible to, to an effect because of their genetic makeup, and then this exposure contributed to that. So I, I think there is definitely evidence suggestive of an association between deployment and symptoms. There's some evidence that says that after deployments, we come back and, we, and people are more likely to be diagnosed with sinusitis and rhinitis and asthma. Um, I think those are rising to the level of certainly, you know, causing the VA uh, to say that we're going to presume presumptively make those service connection connected. I also think there, you know, there's some evidence that clinicians should act on and say, hey, you were deployed, you're coming back with these symptoms, I need to look more closely at this and, and really try to understand better, because this is kind of a special situation. Um, whereas somebody walking in off the street, you know, without kind of a history of some sort of exposure, I might not uh, go as deep into my evaluation of the, of the symptom. I might say, well, let's wait and see what happens, or let's just do this part of the evaluation for now and 
see what happens. But I think with uh, with the with what we know about the exposures, the military exposures during deployment, and some of the health effects, what we see in the research leads me as a clinician to think I should be a little more um, aggressive about a workup for for pulmonary concerns, respiratory concerns in my veteran patients. Right. It is uh, 521, so I just want us to keep an eye on the clock. Um, so if you have you know, questions, be sure to submit them. Um, we had a question come in, can a recommendation be made reconsult to dietary since we've had two research studies that help both war veterans and consults to get complete neuropsych testing because we have seen this with ODS veterans and by being tested, it identifies problems that veterans and family members might not be aware. I'm gonna follow up or recommend like sleep studies or pulmonary function tests and also dermatology consult for skin cancers and veterans. I mean, I, I just, uh, I know Drew will have to talk about this for VA, excuse me, but uh, this is true. There's, there's uh, the studies that have shown some promise for Gulf War illness. Um, the glutamate study, the low glutamate diet has had better outcomes than a lot of the other studies. And so I, I don't know what the process is for VA to be able to recommend it, but apparently the this low glutamate diet won't generally be known to nutritionists or dietitians that work at VA. So there would need to be some special um, training or guidance on how you would apply this diet. Um, and I believe they're going to be doing a bigger study of this also. And so we might be able to, to refine it further. But I think um, for veterans who want to pursue this, I think it could definitely, there could be guidelines provided for them, even by the investigators that um, did the original study. Um, in terms of referrals for the specialties, dermatitis, I, I hear what you're saying. We hear from veterans all the time that they don't feel like they're getting a sufficient workup at VA. They have symptoms. They're not taken seriously. They don't feel sometimes, or, or sometimes they just feel that the they don't get a complete evaluation. And I, you know, I know Drew hears this all the time too, because he is, he worked for many years at the specialty referral center where they take every single problem very seriously. So um, I, you know, I, maybe you can address Drew what, what's required to go from getting a positive finding in a study to actually getting, uh, you know, a nutritional referral or, uh, or a specialty referral of some type. Yeah, the, it, we, we call it the translation of, of scientific evidence into practice. And unfortunately, just in general, it takes a, a long time for that to happen. Um, the, uh, you know, I think the, the diet piece, I think, once again, I like, I like the whole health model, you know, and the idea that you have a team approach to, to the care of patients with complex illnesses like Gulf War illness, um, and that you would have a team of people and maybe including the dietitian saying, what can we do to optimize your diet and maybe explore some of these um, uh, diets that, that have promise. You know, I think, I think it, it hasn't been definitively shown, but I think it's a, a low risk thing to try a diet and try some dietary changes. And so I think in a kind of an individualized management plan, looking at diet and getting a dietary consult is a great idea. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's the same issue. You really need to have that connection with your primary care provider who can bring the team together to help address the needs of the patient holistically and, you know, uh, with some continuity and follow-up. Follow up. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have about five minutes left. And Sharon, I think uh, your, your point is perfectly timed. Uh, Karen writes, we might want to ask participants what kind of exposures that they personally have experienced. So please, if you um, don't mind sharing that, go ahead and you can type that into the chat. Um, part of this is really for uh, our panelists to hear really from y'all what you are going through, what you've experienced. And we did have um, a few questions, uh, just if you don't mind sharing kind of what exposures you have been exposed to or what you might be worried about. Um, also, what types of information or other resources uh, are you looking for um, to be helpful for you? 
Um, are there any topics specifically that you are interested in hearing more about? Um, like they said at the beginning, really, we can bring um, different experts to y'all if there is um, a specific thing you want to hear more about. So please go ahead and share that in the chat. Raise your hand if you want to share. Um, since we are kind of winding down, I don't know if as people are typing that in, if uh, our panelists kind of have any closing um, resources or final thoughts that they want to share with uh, the participants. And I'll also share my screen now. Um, here is, uh, it's kind of small, let me get it up. Um, but some resources that we were able to gather, we will also be emailing this out. So don't feel like you have to write it all down. Um, but I will pass it back over to our panelists if they want to say a few words. No, I, I just would, if we have a few minutes, I think that one thing that's very valuable to veterans who have exposure concerns has been the risk exam. Um, and we mentioned just briefly that Dr. Helmer had uh, led one of those um, sites, the risk sites, to provide specialty care for veterans who are affected by difficult to diagnose conditions and exposure related conditions. And so I think a lot of veterans don't know about it. And I think a lot of their providers don't know about it. So uh, Dr. Helmer, could you just share a few comments about how they get involved in that or when it's appropriate? Sure, so, so the, it's part of this continuum of care, a stepped care approach. And so you, you, need, to be a, you need to be enrolled with the VA, first of all, um, and you should talk to your primary care provider about your military exposures and your, um, your, concern, your related health effects. Uh, the risk does focus on war-related uh, military exposures, although it is a little broader than that. Uh, but, but it is uh, focused primarily on veterans who have been deployed. Uh, once you've kind of worked with your local team at your, at your VA medical center or your CBOC and uh, your, clinic, your clinic, and, and you've kind of exhausted the local expertise and, the, um, and knowledge, uh, it, it's, it's very appropriate then for your provider, your care team to make a referral to the war-related illness and injury study center. It has to be done by the provider and it also has to be, and it's done through the regular consult process in our electronic medical record. Um, and then once that referral gets to the risk, then they, they have a whole evaluation process that they initiate to see whether what the right service is. They offer multiple services of differing intensities and some of it's telemedicine and some of it's in person. Um, and so I think that would be a great, um, you know, then, then that feedback comes back to the care team and, and directly to the patient as well. But it can be a very effective uh, second set of eyes. It's a, it's a team-based approach and a comprehensive approach to uh, chronic multi-symptom illness and military exposure concerns. It's, it's number three on the on the right hand side of the page, VA War Related Illness and Injury Study Center, and and we've heard from a lot of veterans who felt like they really uh, got good care there. And just some of the uh, things coming in on the chat for exposures, um, oil fires for extended periods of time, areas with gas alarms going off. Um, Another is recalled in 1991 for a desert storm, non-deployed and received many inoculations, as Dr. Helmer stated, perhaps a reaction to inoculations. And as Dr. Steele stated, a few inoculations may be in question. Um, and yes, Ming, we um, will be sending out this resource list to everyone who registered. So um, that will be coming your way in the next few days. I am also going to just share the... Um, contact information for our wonderful speakers in case you have any follow-up questions. I know that they would be happy to connect with you. Um, and I believe we have that it's 5.30 now. So I wanna thank you all so, so much. I will let our panelists uh, say any final words, and, but I really appreciate all of y'all taking time to be here today. I'll just say, I, I really look forward 
forward to uh, the next one, the next Sci Cafe on military exposures. And um, I think we'll, we'll take this, uh, you know, the feedback and some of the interest that's been expressed and, and try to come up with something that hopefully you'll, you'll come back for more and, and bring your friends with you. Yes, I'll just echo what Dr. Helmer said. I'm, I'm so glad you came today. We know there's a lot of going, uh, going on in the world right now, especially in the Houston area uh, for veterans. And so um, thank you for joining us. But please um, feel free to use the email addresses that Krista provided. And we'd love to hear from you. We'll answer as best we can. And we look forward to the next site Cafe. Um, and if you'd like to suggest some topics, please do that too. Yes, and, and I'll go ahead and jump on the bandwagon and thank you everybody that was able to join us and please utilize this time to ask your questions. I mean, because you don't know unless you ask. And, you know, I, I have my own personal questions that I've asked Dr. Homer because I didn't know if it even mattered or not. So we definitely encourage you to interact. I mean, that's the whole point of the side part is interaction. And so, um, again, thank you. The biggest thing I can really say for the veterans is A, utilize the VA but also advocate for yourself. If you're not getting where you need to get, you have the right to get another physician or a primary care physician at the VA. So advocate for yourself and get the, the results that you're looking for because that's what they're there for. You may not have the best results with your first physician, but that doesn't mean there's not another physician that's willing to listen to you and take you seriously with all your concerns. So please definitely utilize that. And like I said before, if you are having issues, connect with us. We'll connect you with a healthcare advocacy team that will definitely uh, get you the, the answers that you need. Um, thank you again, Dr. Homer, uh, Dr. Steele, Krista, Becky, everybody. Is, it's been a great pleasure. There are certainly um, health issues that are very specific to the, um, the veteran community. Dr. Homer, Dr. Steele, thank you so much for the work you're doing in the area and Krista um, and, and John, the work that you all are doing to, to get that information out. Um, thank you to the, the veterans and veteran advocates that, that joined us today and also the clinicians who are really trying to get the word out about this information and to their, their own practice and, and to their colleagues. So I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. And if you happen to be in the area, I do hope you'll, you'll stop by. Um, we are a Blue Star Museum, which means that there is free admission for active military and their families. So if you want to come and check out the museum and check out the Veteran Vision Project um, photo gallery that will be um, at the museum through the end of the year. We would love to see you. Again, have a wonderful afternoon and we hope to see you again soon.